Hey folks, welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review. And today we're taking a look at the Hi-Diz AP80 Pro X and also the Hi-Diz DH80S. And in case that just sounds like a bunch of letters and numbers to you, let me explain what they are. The AP Pro 80X here is a little tiny portable music player. So this is a digital audio player or DAP. It's got a built-in DAC, built-in amplifier, and it's going to allow you to play your music at high quality theoretically through your headphones or earphones. Of course, the whole point of this review is to tell you if it does exactly what it's intended to, but we'll get to that in a moment. Before we get there, let me also introduce the DH80S. Now there's two versions of this one. There's the DH80 and the DH80S. From an internal circuit point of view, as I understand it, they are identical. The difference being that the DH80S is this one here, which will work with any device you like while the DH80, the one without the S on the end, is designed specifically as kind of a cradle for an AP80. And that set up an interesting expectation from me, and one that I'm keen to talk about here, because it didn't go according to how I thought it would. But I'm going to come back around to that soon, because it's all about sound quality when we get there. Before we do though, let me introduce the specifications and the key features of the AP80 Pro X and the DH80 DH80S. I'm going to start this review talking about the AP80 Pro X, and that's because this is where the music comes from, so it's kind of the first step in the source chain. It can of course be the only step in the source chain if you don't use something like the external DH80S. And so what we're getting here is a $199 US dollar all-in-one digital audio player. Now I'm going to call it the AP80 throughout this review, but do know that I'm always talking about the AP80 Pro X version. I don't have any other version to compare it to, so it's always the Pro X. Heidi specify the AP80 here as having an 8 hour battery life, and in my usage I don't see any reason to doubt that. As always, these sorts of things with battery life, it's going to depend on the load you've got on it, i.e. how difficult the headphones or earphones are to drive, how loud you're listening to it, what gain level it's in, all that sort of stuff is going to influence battery life. But think around about 8 hours. As we'll see in a moment, the AP80 has both balanced and single ended outputs, and that means you've got two different power output levels because it is actually a properly balanced design. And the balanced output will give you 190 milliwatts into a 32 ohm load, while the single ended output will give you just 70 milliwatts. Now I say just 70, realistically when you put that into context, 70 milliwatts is still enough to drive most headphones you're likely to run it with. It's going to start to struggle with some of the very difficult planers on the market. I would never suggest this for something like a Sasvara, and even expecting it to drive something like an Aria Stealth Edition, whilst it's going to have decent levels of volume, it's not necessarily going to be the highest quality, and therefore I would question whether it's the right pairing. We're talking about a super compact $200 all-in-one device here. That means for me that it's designed to run with kind of entry-level through to mid-tier headphones, and of course IEMs. Now with IEMs, and I will get to this later, I think it's a great pairing with IEMs up to a higher level, so into that sort of thousand dollar range, it still sounds fantastic. But I guess my point is that you shouldn't buy this and think it's a budget way to achieve super high end performance with a high, high level of headphones. And to put that into context, I used the DCA Stealths for some of my testing of this one, and in high gain mode, it was requiring about 80% of the volume to drive the Stealths to very comfortable listening levels. There was no sense of harshness or distortion from the sound. And so that's where I'm saying it can do the job. It's got no problems having enough power, but it becomes very evident if you then take that same pair of headphones and plug it into a better source, let's say a Chord Mojo 2, all of a sudden you hear everything that's missing from a compact device like this. And that's not a knock on this at all, as we'll get to soon. It's just the reality of what you're getting when you spend more money. Moving on from power though, let's talk about what else is going on in here. We've got a couple of DAC chips from ESS, namely the E9219C chips, which apparently are some of the latest on the market. I haven't verified that claim, but that's what the Heidi's marketing says. And the reason I haven't bothered to verify it is I don't really care. As long as it sounds good, I don't really mind which DAC chips are being used. 
Realistically, most of the DAC chips that have been around for the last five or six years can all do everything we need them to. There might be tiny gains to be had in a decimal point of total harmonic distortion and specifications like that, but when you're actually listening, you're not going to hear those things, and so it does come back, for me at least, to the subjective listening experience. What those chips do mean though, is that this little device can decode DSD-256, which also means it can handle super high sample rate PCM, so your 384 type kilohertz. It will also handle MQA, but it's worth noting there's no streaming capabilities here. So that decoding of MQA is either going to be if you've got local files here, or if you're using this as a USB DAC. And that brings me to the next point. The USB-C socket on the bottom will both output audio, but also receive audio coming in. So you can connect this up to your computer and have all of the features I just spoke about coming out of this tiny little box. And I actually nearly put this in my upcoming fondle of the Uber dongles. You're going to have to subscribe if you want to find out what that one is. But the point is, it's a really versatile device, being able to have its own locally stored music on an SD card, by also being able to output that music to a high quality source should you want to, as well as being able to act as a DAC for say a laptop or a phone, and that's where the MQA might be useful. If you're streaming Tidal via your phone or a laptop, this will decode the MQA. So it's not completely irrelevant that MQA is there, but I did want to call out that it's not actually going to get you much MQA playback unless you've got local files or you're using it with an external source. The final thing I should mention is there's also Bluetooth on here, and it does handle the high-res codecs, and it's also two-way. So it's a really, really fully featured device in a tiny little package, and so on paper, it looks like an absolute bargain. The question for me, of course, is whether that stacks up with sound, and we'll get to that in a moment. But before we do, I want to talk about a couple of other little features. And I say little features, but for some people they're big features. And that is that the AP80 Pro X offers you both a five band graphic equalizer, as well as what they call the Magic Sound 8 Ball. This is a feature that's popped up in other devices. I think from memory, SMSL also had this on one of their streaming devices. And the idea of the Magic Sound 8 Ball is it gives you vast control over lots of different characteristics. It's kind of, in my opinion, a bit like an equalizer on steroids. It doesn't give you the fine control of say a parametric equalizer, in terms of being able to adjust the width and the tightness of the peaks and the cuts, but what it does allow you to do is focus in on specific character of the sound. Now I don't know exactly how it's doing the alterations, and I would guarantee it's no longer a bit perfect once you do it, but if you want to be able to tweak the sound to suit your specific earphones or headphones, the Magic Sound 8 Ball is great. It gives you the ability to adjust things like, obviously you can play with tone controls, treble, mids and bass, but then also the character of the sound, how smooth it is, how edgy it is, whether the bass is punchy or full, there's lots of different things you can tweak, and they're not huge changes, but they all add up. And so it's a nice little feature, it's not the sort of feature I personally tend to use, but I know some people will really value having it there, particularly if this is a device that you're only going to use with a single pair of headphones or earphones, and you can really kind of tune it to sound exactly the way you want. And so I'm not going to go through a lot more detail on it, it's there if you're interested, go read up on it if you want to know more about it, because what I want to do instead is get into a quick tour of the device and then how it sounds. But starting with the tour, things are pretty simple as you'd expect, it's a very compact device. But as we go around the device, you've got this lovely little touch screen here, it's fairly compact, but it's not too compact. So even things like accessing the slider to seek through tracks is easily done despite the tiny screen. It gives you access to different play modes, it does gapless, it's got replay gain, all of the things you expect, it's all available through the screen there. And then as we go around the device on this side here, we've got the power button, which is also your volume wheel. We've got forwards and backwards and play pause buttons as well. Moving down to the bottom, we've got a 3.5mm single ended output, a USB-C socket which as I've already said is both in and output of music, and then we've got a 2.5mm balance connection. And I've just recently done a review of the Sennheiser i 600s where I talked about the fact that the 2.5mm connection is becoming less and less common. Now obviously here there's such limited real estate, I understand why they used it, but that's probably one slight drawback for me is I'm not as much of a fan of the 2.5 as I am the 4.4mm, but you could always get a little adapter as I did in order to connect up to this one. The nice thing is, it's a fully balanced design in a tiny tiny package, so I'm not going to knock them for having a 2.5mm connector, it's much better than not having it at all. The final thing to look at is that on the side here we've got a micro SD card slot, I've got a 256 gigabyte card in there, I haven't actually checked what the maximum is, but most devices these days will give you over a terabyte worth of music if you want to. So there's no reason you couldn't carry your entire library on this thing, and you're going to need to because there's no streaming capabilities. So unless you're going to be sending it music via Bluetooth, or as I said before, using it more as an external kind of Uber dongle, 
If you're not doing that with it, then you're probably going to want to load up a bunch of tracks on that micro SD card. I should also mention at this stage that it does also have an ebook reading capability and also a step counter. I don't know if people care about those features. I certainly don't in a device like this, but maybe you will. So the ebook reader means you can actually read the book on the screen. It's not an audio book reader necessarily, but it will play audio files. So of course you can listen to audio books as long as you don't want the chapter functions. But this is actually an ebook reader. So you can actually scroll through the text and read it on the screen should you want to. And then also a step counter, I assume for those that want to chuck this in their pocket and go for a walk or a run. And so that kind of sums up the features, the specifications, the design of the AP80. And so from here, we're going to focus on sound quality. And I'm going to focus entirely on the wired sound quality. I'm not bothering to talk about Bluetooth because realistically, Bluetooth is affected by your end source device. And in my experience, the difference between one Bluetooth sending device and another, i.e. Bluetooth music source, is very minimal if there's even a difference. So all of what I'm about to tell you now is about the wide sound quality of the AP80 Pro X. I'm going to start by quickly talking about the single-ended versus the balanced output of the AP80. And that is to say that the single-ended output is still very good, but the balanced output is better in my opinion. The balanced output provides more separation and clarity in the sound, not by a huge margin, but it's enough that I would say that if you can run it balanced, you should. But if you're buying it knowing that you've got single-ended earphones or headphones, don't worry about it. You're not missing out on too much. Some devices have quite a gulf between the single-ended and the balanced outputs. I'm pleased to say there's no gulf here. There's a slight drop-off, but it's not huge. As always for my testing of this, I cycled through a whole bunch of tracks that I had on my memory card, and one specific track that came on was Better Days by Supertramp. This recording's quite a crisp, dry recording. It's quite punchy, but a little bit clinical in a way. And the sound from the AP80 using the IE600s, that's the Sennheiser IE600 IEMs, was really punchy and really clean. It sounded fantastic. And I should mention that all of my testing here is being done with the balanced output. What I heard from the i600s and the AP80 was a great sense of soundstage, good image separation, and there was no obvious color or character from the AP80. By this stage, I'd used the i600s across a whole range of devices, so I had a really good handle on how they sound, and I didn't feel like the AP80 was adding or taking anything away from them. And that's ultimately, in my opinion, what we want from a source. It's one thing if you're buying an amplifier for a specific coloration, a specific style of sound, but when everything's wrapped up in one unit, I always feel like it's best if it's got a relatively neutral sound, and the AP80 to my ears definitely does. To help me understand just how it really was performing though, I grabbed the Earman Sparrow, and the reason I grabbed that, that's a dongle device for those that aren't familiar with it. I grabbed the Sparrow because it costs exactly the same price as the AP80, but being just a dongle, you then have to feed it with your phone. Now, most of us already have phones, so the question for me was, is it better to go out and buy an AP80 so you've got it all in one in that little tiny device, or are you better off using the phone that you've probably already got with you that also has streaming capabilities and just connect it up to a tiny little dongle like the Sparrow? Listening to the same various tracks, including Better Days by Supertramp with the Sparrow, there were a couple of things that really stood out to me. First of all, the Sparrow required a little bit less on the volume control to reach the same sound pressure levels from something like, say, the DCA Stealths. So it has got a bit more power to give you than the AP80 does. Something else that I heard from the Sparrow was that the sound was a bit more articulate and a bit crisper. And that's one of the things I love about the Sparrow is it's got this beautiful, crisp, detailed and articulate sound, but it's never cold or harsh or lean. On the flip side, the AP80 does come across just a tiny bit richer, a tiny bit smoother. And I'm not going to say that one of them is better or worse because it's always going to come down to the synergy with your particular device, i.e. your earphones or your headphones. What I would say instead is that I feel like the Sparrow and the AP80 are pretty much on par. And that's great because the Sparrow is still one of my favorite dongles for under $200. I know it's only just under $200, but you get the point that it's around that price point where the AP80 sits. The Sparrow is a fantastic dongle, and the AP80 is sitting there right alongside it. The Sparrow happens to be one of those devices where there is a bit of a gulf, in my opinion, between the balanced output and the single-ended, 
And so that's also a nod towards the AP80 because it's giving you a better output from the single-ended compared to the Sparrow. And that makes it a bit more versatile. The fact that you can also feed the AP80 from your phone means that it can do everything the Sparrow does. It just happens to be a bit more versatile with the extra stuff it can do and a bit more bulky as well. And ultimately, as I went back and forth on different tracks, different earphones, particularly thinking about better days with Supertramp, what I found was that the AP80 could be more consistently enjoyable across a range of tracks and a range of different headphones and earphones because it is that little bit smoother. It is going to help to just kind of smooth off the edges of the nastiness in some bad recordings or some harsh earphones or headphones. Whereas the Sparrow is going to be a little bit more brutal, but it's a little bit more brutal than something like the AP80. And so don't think that's a gentle way of saying the AP80 is mushy and soft. It's definitely not. It's just got a lovely character to its sound that helps to prevent things getting nasty. And so at this point, I was pretty impressed. And now we get to the expectation that I came in with about the DH80. Knowing that the DH80, that's the non-S version, is designed specifically to kind of mount together with the AP80. So it's got a little thing like an iPhone docking station, for instance. It's got this little hook bit where you can actually click the AP80 in. I automatically assumed that it must therefore be an upgrade for the AP80. And so I connected both together and I did some more testing. Before I talk about the results of that testing, let me quickly introduce this one. The DH80S is a 140 US dollar kind of little external amp and DAC combo. As I said before, the non-S version is designed specifically to work with the AP80. The S version that I've got here is more universal. You do get a little metal disc that goes with the AP80, so you can still have them magnetized together. And indeed that disc can stick to any device you've got. So if you've got a different sort of source, you can stick this disc to the back of it and it will stick nicely to the DH80. But essentially what you're getting here is a very simple amp DAC combo. And I don't mean that in a negative way. My point is it doesn't have Bluetooth. It doesn't do streaming. There's no interface. It's just an on off DAC amp. Inside the DH80S is quite a similar circuit to what's inside the AP80. So you're getting the same two DAC chips. There's a couple of other minor variances in terms of the way it handles the signal with oscillator chips versus FPGAs and stuff like that. I'm going to leave that for you to check out the website if you want to dive into that sort of stuff. But the key thing is it's a pretty similar circuit. For whatever reason, this only handles DSD-128, whereas the AP80 goes to DSD-256, if that matters. But other than that, everything's pretty much the same with its decoding capabilities. Where the DH80 does step forward, though, is it does have more power than the AP80. So you can get 210 milliwatts out of this one into 32 ohms versus 190 from the AP80. So only an extra 20 milliwatts, and that's where I started to question the value and the purpose of this. And so I assumed it was going to sound somehow much better. While I leave that one hanging there, let's do a quick tour of the device. Down one side, we've got an on off switch and we've got volume control up and down. Now what's nice is the volume control on the DH80S works with the AP80 and vice versa. What I mean by that is you can use the volume control on the AP80 with the wheel and or you can use the volume control here. They both control the same volume, which is the one on the AP80. Just below the on off switch here, we've also got a sample rate light that's going to tell you what you're listening to at the time. And it uses a few different colors as lots of these devices do to tell you if it's high res, regular red book CD, NQA, etc. And then as we come down to the bottom of the device, we've got the on off status light. We've got the USB-C input for the signal coming in for your actual audio signal that is, because next to that there's also USB-C for charging. And this is quite common. What we're seeing now is that a lot of these devices separate the power for charging from the audio signal. And that's gonna help reduce noise getting into the circuit. It also means that you can run it with something like a smartphone or in this case, the AP80 and not be draining the battery by trying to charge at the same time as playing. And that's great if you want extended battery life from your source device, these sorts of devices and the AP82, if you're using it as a dongle, will both preserve the battery life in say your phone. And I keep pointing over here because my phone's sitting down there. It's gonna improve the battery life of those because it's not drawing the power for the amplification, etc., from the phone. Also on the bottom panel here, we've got a 3.5 mil output and also a 4.4 mil. And so by having a dedicated device here with a bit more space available, we are able to get a 4.4 mil out of the DH80. And that kind of added to my expectations that this was going to sound better. My assumptions coming into this was that this was kind of like the fully formed version of the AP80's internal audio circuit because there was more space to work with. We've got full size connectors, all those sorts of things. Now you know where I'm going with this already, so let me finish the tour really quickly. The final thing we've got here is a three step gain switch, low, medium and high. And again, that added to my expectations that this was the more advanced audio circuit. 
But when I fired up a comparison to try the direct output, and again, I'm just using balance for these comparisons, the direct output from the AP80 and the output via the DH80S, while listening to the birthday song part two by Joshua Redman, what I heard was that the AP80 sounded smooth, natural, textured. It just sounded wonderful. Going over to the DH80S and things sounded a bit thicker, a little bit more closed in. And to be clear, I was using the AP80 as the source in both occasions. So either it was connecting directly to the headphone output of the AP80 or it was going via USB-C from the AP80 into the DH80S and then using the 4.4mm socket on the DH80S. And whilst the DH80S didn't sound bad, the AP80 brought out more of the music. It was more articulate overall, so on the track like the birthday song, listening to Joshua Redman's saxophone, there was more of the texture in the sax. And the snap of the snares had a bit more life to them, a bit more energy, a bit more texture. They didn't get harsh, but they were just a bit more lifelike, a bit more alive than from the DH80S. I feel like the DH80S was just a little bit dull overall. It just kind of made things a bit less energetic, a bit less engaging, a bit less exciting. Another thing that's a benefit towards the AP80 is it produces the larger soundstage with the better sense of separation. And so at this point, you can probably tell I'm not overly impressed with the DH80, but I really like the AP80. I think if you're looking at the DH80S as kind of a powered dongle that's not going to drain your battery and give you plenty of power output, then it's probably not a bad choice. But at that 140 US dollar point, you could spend a little bit more and get something like a Sparrow. You could spend a little bit more and also get something like an AP80. Or you could spend around about the same and get something like a Moon River 2. And I'm going off the top of my head with those prices, so I might be a little bit off with the Moon River 2. But my point is, there's other competition around that same price point, being 140 US dollars, that's going to give you better sound. And so for me, I don't think the DH80S is a particularly strong proposition. I would much prefer to have the AP80 all on its own because it's tiny, it sounds better. You don't really need that extra 20 milliwatts in almost any case that I can think of, for a portable device that is. And so my recommendations to wrap all this up is that if you are looking for a very compact do-it-all device, the AP80 Pro X is absolutely fantastic. If it happened to have streaming capabilities, that would take it over the top for me. But as it is, it's still a fantastic product and one that I'll gladly recommend. And just to recap why that is, I love the fact that it takes audio in via USB, it spits audio out via USB so you can use it just as a transport, it sounds great all on its own if you've got a memory card in there and you can load up all of your files. It's just a wonderful compact do-it-all device. It can also provide a Bluetooth source if you've got Bluetooth headphones, and it can receive a Bluetooth input if you wanted to feed it audio from, say, your phone. And so there's so many different options that the AP80 gives you. The DH80S for me doesn't really stack up because I think there's better options in the market other than the fact that it does give you plenty of power and that battery so it's not going to drain your source as much. But I still think I'd choose something like a Moon River 2 or maybe an Eman Sparrow and just charge my phone or whatever my audio source is a bit more often. And so hopefully this has helped to clarify for you the different value, the purposes of these devices, whether they're relevant for your needs. If you have found it useful and helpful, I'd love it if you'd hit the like button, consider subscribing and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. But for now, let me leave it to the music, so happy listening and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Mm -hmm.